This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. Thousands of years of chronology is laid out in the Bible, and the biggest chunk of that is actually written down in Genesis. And more specifically, most of it happens in two chapters, Genesis 5 and 11, in the form of genealogies. People like to study these and other genealogies in the Bible to come up with a chronology of events in world history, which is helpful for like archaeology, for example, when you're trying to date artifacts and line them up with events in history. Henry Smith has been working on the Genesis 5 and 11 chronology project for a number of years, has written and spoke about it a lot, and he's going to talk about it with us today. And spoiler alert, it's going to be controversial, but we'll get to that in a bit. I kind of feel like either people are going to really like this discussion or they're going to turn it off instantly because (laughs) not everyone finds chronology or genealogy interesting. There's lots of numbers, but maybe if they know it's going to be controversial, then they'll stick around (laughs) because we're going to be talking about your theory. Yeah. We actually did another podcast about genealogy in general and talked about what kinds of genealogies are in the Bible, how they were written, how weird the Genesis genealogies are, like how Adam, Noah, and Methuselah all live to be like... 930, 950, 969 years old. And then they had their next generation that was born when they were like 130 years old. Yes. So we're not going to get into all of those specifics today. So you can go back and listen to that one if you're interested in that. But I did want to give everyone kind of a roadmap for the stuff we're going to be talking about today because there's a lot of ground to cover. And honestly, it feels like the whole thing is in the weeds. (laughs) So first, we're going to talk about the source material for these genealogies the manuscripts of the Bible and some outside the Bible, like from early Christian historians. Then we're going to talk a bit about these numbers that are contained in the genealogies and how actually the numbers differ in these ancient manuscripts, which suddenly becomes pretty interesting. Yes. And then the question becomes, why are they different and who changed them and why? Yeah. And that's where the controversy comes in. So Henry, let's start out with the source material. Where do our Bibles come from that contain Genesis and these genealogies and... What are some of the differences? Yeah, it's good. So um, let's start with the Hebrew text because that is where where the text originated as as a Hebrew uh, product. So in, and we have now in the modern day preserved for us what's called the Masoretic text. So uh, these were uh, Jewish scribes who preserved the text in the medieval period, and they added vowels to it for pronunciation purposes. Like and about a thousand years ago, nine hundred, a thousand. Yeah, something. well, the, the Masoretes were like six to eight hundred, okay. nine hundred. You know, there's a little bit of a dispute about about the exact time, and they had predecessors before them. So the biblical text, the Hebrew, uh, has been preserved very well for us. Uh, there are exceptions, and we're going to talk about that, and. Um, we, there's other discoveries beyond what's called the Masoretic text, like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm-hmm. that they, you can draw comparisons to them and other texts. But the Masoretic but, text, that's what our modern-day Bibles— Are largely based on. Based on. Yeah, okay. that's that's what modern scholars use to translate to English, so from Hebrew to English. Uh, we have another version of Genesis 5 and 11, what's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. So sure. we know about the Samaritans, uh, the Good Samaritan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the They preserve their own— version of the Bible independent of the Old Testament, the first five books, I should say. The Torah, Pentateuch. The Torah, that's right. They did not believe in the rest of the canon. But the, the main point here is the Samaritan Pentateuch preserves the Torah. It's written in a sort of unique kind of Hebrew text, the Samaritan script. Some of the numbers match what's in the Masoretic text in Genesis 5. But then later in Genesis 5, the numbers are different. Some of the lifespans are different. Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech. So is the Samaritan Pentateuch older than the Masoretic text? Well, the oldest manuscript that is available of the Samaritan Pentateuch is, I don't know, 12th or 13th century AD. Okay. It's kept by the Samaritan priest in Shechem, okay. in, in Nablus, which is where they live today. And there's still a small remnant of the Samaritans who they have their unique form of worship and all that other kind of thing. Now, the text uh, points back to a much more ancient text. Okay. So they preserved their it. own, just like the Masoretes preserved the Correct. Hebrew. They Correct. Preserved. Okay. So you can already t- talk about how you could compare these two texts with each other okay. to see which one is superior, which one has more faithfully preserved it. 
so you already have points of comparison. Really, the Samaritan Pentateuch wasn't known until in Europe until about the 16th century. So it was completely unknown to the outside world until that time. And when it was discovered, quote unquote, it was a treasure because it gives us another line of preservation. Okay. And then the third is the Greek translation, what we call the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. So, and that was done in Egypt and Alexandria in, in the third century BC. The first five books were, the other ones were done later. And in the Septuagint, we have numbers as well. And these numbers differ in Genesis 5 compared to the Masoretic and part of the Samaritan Pentateuch. And then to make things more complicated, in the post-flood period, much of the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Greek text match, hmm. and the Masoretic text differs from the Samaritan and the Greek. Mm -hmm. And so the point of this is when you calculate the periods of time for before the flood and after the flood, in each of these three traditions, you get different numbers. Hmm. So you get different dates for the flood, you get different dates for Adam, you get different dates for Abraham mm -hmm. when you compare them together because the numbers are different. Yeah. So now, why would anyone care about any of the other? I mean, people would care because it's another comparison, but why wouldn't you just say, oh, the Masoretic text? Well, that's Hebrew. Right. You know, what's the Septuagint is older than the Masoretic text? Like the original, like the oldest copies we have of Septuagint. Is that from way older? And that's why there might be some credibility there? Yeah. Well, we know for certain that, let's just talk about Genesis okay. just to keep it keep it more focused. We know that the Genesis text was translated in Egypt in the third century BC from a Hebrew text that okay. they were using directly. Okay. Now what that Hebrew text was exactly, we don't know because we don't have it anymore. Okay. But it it's pointing to quite an ancient text. Okay. Now the Masoretic text, we don't have texts that are that old, but we know that it goes back far. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and then the same thing with the Samaritan Pentateuch. So even though the manuscripts are later, they all point to they all point to something older. that's of quite quite ancient. Mm -hmm. Here's the bottom line: Why were the numbers changed? Okay, so you ask the, yeah. you ask the question: The numbers differ. Somebody changed them, they're, and they're not the result of accident. So some in a couple of manuscripts, there's evidence that there's some scribal error, but they've been changed by off a hundred years. So let's give an example. Well, uh, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, can we set that up a, maybe a little bit more? Sure. That when you compare the Hebrew Bible with, let's just just do the Septuagint for now, that the ages are the same of, you know, how old Noah was and that kind of stuff. But when they had their first kid or the kid uh, in the genealogy, it's different, almost all of them, by exactly 100 years. Yes. That seems, in my mind, or at least when I was first heard this, and it's like, oh, well, the Greek's a translation, so why would that matter? Obviously, you know, they added a hundred years. I don't know why they did that, but it's a round number. They, our Bible's right. Like that's sure. that was that was my mindset. But the point was like, there's a. I know there's other stuff too, but sure. in general, all these guys had a hundred years added to you know their genealogy, basically. Yes, if if you compare the the Masoretic and the Greek in Genesis five, okay, to your point, that's exactly right. There's a six hundred year difference. Between the texts. Now, Lamech's numbers in the Greek are, are scrambled. There's some problems there. So we'll just put that aside for a moment. But someone has systematically revised the numbers. Okay. Uh, now, if you begin with the assumption that the Masoretic text is the original, then you would conclude that somebody in the Greek translation inflated Adam's begetting age. So in the Hebrew, it's 130. In the Greek, it's 230. And begetting is, that's when they had their son. When they had the next son in line. So yeah. in the case of Adam, the next son is Seth. So... That's a 100-year difference. So when you're calculating your chronology, add that up over a period of time, that changes the time period. Mm -hmm. So that's significant. Uh, it also tells us that whoever changed the text was doing it for chronological reasons. Mm -hmm. They were trying to uh, change or either inflate or deflate the chronology. Mm -hmm. The question is, why? Right? That's one of the questions we ask of that when we have these kind of differences. Yes, the default button has been we follow the Masoretic, so therefore, the Septuagint has been inflated. Okay. That's sort of like the default mode in sort of evangelical scholarship. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. doesn't I? I want to add throw yes. one more text in here. So we've got the Masoretic. That's what our 
modern Bibles are mostly based off of. Then there was this tremendous discovery in the 50s of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. Now, isn't that the Hebrew Bible? Well, it's a library with lots of stuff, but it has the Hebrew Bible. It has Genesis. When you compare the Masoretic text to Genesis 5 in the Dead Sea Scrolls, how do those compare? Yeah, unfortunately, that we didn't find anything that preserved the numbers. Oh, okay, so it's so disappointing because okay. it would have confirmed, or it would have, yeah, it would have put a, a a big stamp on in one direction or the other, depending on what we found. Okay, and there was no scrolls found, unfortunately, and it's really disappointing because it would be it would really be a, dis, a decisive piece of evidence. Okay, because it would put you a thousand years earlier than yeah. the, than the uh, okay. Masoretic text that we have now. And now the problem is complicated by the Samaritan Pentateuch, which has a mixture of the two. It has a mixture of matching the Masoretic and matching the Septuagint. Okay. So in your English Bibles, you'll read the numbers that are in the Masoretic text. Okay. Now in other places in your Bible, once in a while, you'll see a footnote that'll say, you know, have a little footnote next to a, a verse. And then down at the bottom will say, Dead Sea Scrolls Septuagint. Hmm. All right. And what it's telling you is that the, the translators think that the text in the Masoretic is inferior to what's been found in the Dead Sea or the Septuagint text. Mm -hmm. That's why that's there. Mm -hmm. So they think that's the original okay. based on whatever the argument happens to be. It depends on what text it is. Mm -hmm. We don't see that in English Bible for Genesis 5 and 11, but we should <laughs> mm. because uh, we do have these three traditions that differ from each other sub sub significantly. And the question is, if you want to discover if you believe in the doctrine of preservation, which is that God has preserved his word somewhere in the manuscripts, which one is the original? We want to know mm -hmm. which text is the original numbers given to Moses under the inspiration of the Spirit when he wrote the original numbers in Genesis 5 and 11. So if you have differing traditions, then somebody changed them. Yeah. And, so the question and, is, which one is the right one? And in the other two traditions, why were they changed? That's an important question that we have to ask. It's not just that well, they were changed, well, but what's the reason? Well, and it's a huge question because once you start talking about, what do you mean the Bible was changed? Yes. like That's like a huge deal. And whether it's just one small piece or a large piece, like that could really, people could lose faith over that. Yes. And so that's, it just, even just talking about, like, this is a controversial subject yes. that people get into. Yeah, so let, let's let's talk about that. I think that's important because we want to frame, when we think about doctrine, where we got to, like, think about the doctrine of Christ, doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of God. Where we get that from? We get oh, from wow. Scripture, mm -hmm. right? What's our doctrine of Scripture come from? It comes from Scripture itself. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like a circular Scriptures. kind of thing, but it's actually... God, if, if God is speaking in the text, which we would affirm that he is, then he's telling us what scripture is in scripture. So it's God's speech telling, in other words, if we have to appeal to another authority, then God has been already removed from the, as the authority. Okay. So we want to go to scripture to determine what our doctrine of scripture is. So we talk a lot about inspiration, right? God breathed. The text is God breathed. God, in, Peter says, God Moved men born along by the Holy Spirit, right? It's a mm -hmm. passive sense of the word, the verb there in the Greek. It's passive. Thus saith the Lord is all over the Old Testament. These are things God says to Isaiah, write this down. These are my words, okay? And we have another dimension of this, and that's what we call the doctrine of preservation, mm -hmm. okay? In inspiration, the Spirit is working to infallibly, without error, to write exactly what it is that God once said. It's his speech. But once that inspiration process ends, now we have we pick up with preservation. Mm -hmm. So in what manner is the text preserved? Because if it's not preserved, how can we obey it? Yeah. Right? There's a very there's a logic to preservation. You're a Christian, you believe your Bible, you believe in a doctrine of preservation, even though you've never thought about it. Because you're assuming that what you're reading are the commands of God that you need to obey. Mm -hmm. So we all operate with a doctrine of preservation, but the question is, what's the mechanics of that? Mm -hmm. Or you remember the, um, uh, maybe folks don't know about this, but uh, when they first started printing the Bible, uh, there's the um, the wicked Bible because they made a, a huge mistake in the Decalogue. It says, thou shalt commit adultery. Huh. And there was a huge controversy about that. It was, it was, you know, burn the Bibles because it says thou shalt commit adultery. Now, no one in their right mind 
would say, see, see, the Bible endorses adultery. Yeah. Everybody understood that that was what we call a scribal, in, in the manuscripts, there's scribal errors. Mm-hmm. In this case, it was a typo. Somebody messed up. Now, what a funny thing to mess up with, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, obviously we know the original didn't say that. Yeah. There's a human error. So we see how human errors can creep in the preservation of the text. But in the Bible itself, we have general promises from God that he'll keep his word, that his word is preserved for us. We can't obey it unless it's been preserved. I mean, it's impossible for us to even understand it if it hasn't been preserved. So in the imprint of the Bible is what I'm getting at here is there's a general doctrine of preservation that Mm -hmm. that's implied and is there. Mm -hmm. But the Bible doesn't give us the mechanics of it. So it doesn't say the original text of the Bible must always be a Hebrew manuscript. We don't, we don't have that. Now, that is the case most of the time that, mm-hmm. that that's what we have. We have Hebrew manuscripts that preserve the original. But we also have cases where the Greek text is actually a superior text. Mm-hmm. And it's clear from other texts when you compare the Latin text and Syriac and other languages and you put all the evidence together, you find, you know what? It looks like the Septuagint has actually, the Greek has actually preserved a superior Hebrew text here. And therefore, we believe this is the original text. Mm-hmm. There's nothing in scripture that tells us that, that that's not possible, okay? So that's the framework we want to set up for the audience is think about what is it you assume about your doctrine of preservation? Because when you hear that the Bible's been changed, that'll set off alarm bells. Mm-hmm. But if you believe that God is absolutely providentially sovereign, that his word is preserved, uh, again, I'll, I'll say it just to repeat, we can't obey God's commands unless they've been preserved for us. Mm-hmm. And we also have, I'll, the last thing, last thing I'll add, add to that is the analogy from, from the time of Josiah. The word of God almost disappeared from the covenant community of Israel. And what do they find? They found the book of the Torah hidden in the temple. So what do you have there? You have really the inferred doctrine of preservation. You have a covenant com- people, people who have almost completely walked away from God. And God still preserved his word. Mm -hmm. And what did it cause? Well, it caused a a revival Revival, in the country, right? They opened it up and they repented and all that kind of stuff happened. So there you have an inference, a text that's not a, it's a descriptive text, but it's telling us something about God's determination to preserve his word. So the question in the, as far as the numbers go is if you have a, a strong, but proper doctrine of preservation, God inspires the original author he preserves the text, but the mechanics of that preservation, you could have the original text in the Samaritan Pentateuch, you could have it in the Masoretic text, you could have it in the Greek, or you could have it in a combination of the three. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So the question is, what are the original numbers? Yeah. Right? Now, that's a pretty heavy task to sort through because the problem goes back to antiquity. Yeah. You know, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, a fourth century church father, is the first one to document all the differences of the numbers. He was the first one that we have. We The differences go back before that, but he's the first one to put them all together in one document. In his in his writings, he was analyzing it himself, and yes. he discovered these things and was writing down in his book about that, his discoveries. That's right. He had a, he was writing a chronology. Okay. We talked about chronology, right? This is, the church was deeply interested in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Eusebius uh, had access. He lived in Caesarea. He was a prolific uh, and scholar. when you say he lived in the 300s or the 400s? I think he wrote his chronology in 310. 310, okay. Somewhere around then. Okay. So this is, this is pretty early in the okay. history of the church. Church, okay. So we already have then, there's our starting point is with Eusebius. Okay. Uh, and most of the numbers that he records are pretty much in line with what we know about it today with some variations, but okay. small variations. But so he was asking that same question 1,700 years ago. Mm-hmm. Why are these numbers different? Who changed them? Why were they changed? What are the originals? Mm-hmm. And so he made a series of arguments in his case for the Greek text, which he believed was so he analyzed the the Hebrew Bible and the he Samaritan had, Pentateuch. Samaritan, oh, he had, oh, that was one of his things. Okay, yeah. yeah, he documented the numbers in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay, and he did intertextual calculations, which really is helpful. You know, so he would add up certain numbers. This person was born this many years after this one. He did all kinds of internal calculations, which is really helpful because it makes you, you can double check his manuscripts because we have the same issue, right? Eusebius manuscripts have to be preserved over time, right? Mm. There, we don't have a doctrine of preservation, right? But we have 
old ancient texts. How do we know Eusebius's numbers weren't changed? Mm -hmm. Well, he's got internal calculations that mm -hmm. help you determine, make sure they're, and a lot of them match the manuscripts that we have today. But, but that's also interesting to me because you know, we, we were just talking about the Spirit of Pentateuch. The oldest copy you said was around 1400s, somewhere in there. Right. The tradition goes back further that points to, you know, but then here you have a guy who wrote a book in 300 who says, hey, I got a copy of the Samaritan stuff. Here's what it says. Yes, that's exactly so that, right. That's another proof that it it went back that far. And a century least. a century later, Jerome also consults Samaritan manuscripts when he's discussing this issue. Jerome, who wrote the Latin Vulgate, the translation, which was the was the translation for, of the church for a thousand years. Yeah, he wrote the uh, the Catholic, basically the Catholic Bible in Latin, essentially. And he was a prolific, one of the most important persons in the history of the church. Jerome, and he had access to Samaritan manuscripts. Greek manuscripts and Hebrew manuscripts. These are pre-Masoretic Hebrew manuscripts. This is before the Masoretes even existed. And he interacted with the rabbis, you know what I mean? So we have a lot of, my point about Jerome and Eusebius is that this is the rich heritage of the church that we have. We have access to these writings that give us a snapshot of manuscripts from that time period. When Eusebius is recording this stuff, he's got documents, mm -hmm. biblical manuscripts that we don't have anymore. They're gone. Yeah. Uh, they've disappeared, but we have Eusebius' recording of them. So they're like a, it's like a it's photo a shot, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing about numbers, as much as they make our eyes glaze over, they're easy to translate. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. like if you're translating poetry from Hebrew to Greek, that's a very difficult thing to really get the meaning from over from one language to the other. It can be hard, Yeah, but numbers are easy. Yeah, 930, yeah. Adam's age, when he died, is 930. Yeah, That's not difficult to translate at all. So that's the easy part about the numbers mm -hmm. is you don't have to deal with translation issues and grammar and all that other kind of obstacles that occur in translation activity. Numbers are numbers. Yeah. Now I've heard of Jerome before. I hadn't really heard of, well, I may have heard of Eusebius before, but I don't know anything about him. Now, didn't Josephus do, do like a whole history work kind of deal? And I know Josephus is a highly respected name and people refer to his stuff as probably even more scholars might have his stuff more reliable than the Bible because they, I don't know why, but they yeah. refer to him. So did he have witness to these things too? That's right. So J Josephus, he did. And he, he, it's fascinating Josephus, right? So he's a, he's a first century Jewish general in the revolt and he gets captured by the Romans and he switched sides and he went to Rome. You okay. know, he was taken by the Romans in there. And there he wrote, the Wars of the Jews and Antiquities of the Jews and mm -hmm. Against Appion, which is a, an apologetic for the for the Hebrew Bible, essentially the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. But the book Antiquities in particular, he documents the numbers and the names from Genesis 5 and 11. He does calculations for those time periods. And so now we have somebody in the first century. Okay. Now we're early. Was, now, would he have been contemporary with Jesus? A little, la little later. Later, okay. This, that same he, century, but after Same Jesus. century. So, so, so Josephus is writing in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. Okay. So this is, this is really old antiquity material. So now we have, like we described with Eusebius, Josephus, what do we have? A snapshot. So if he's recording numbers from Genesis 5 and 11, what is that a snapshot of? That's a snapshot of a manuscript from the first century recording the numbers. So this is part of the investigation. Like now we got a witness mm -hmm. from in 2000 years ago who's got a manuscript in his hands. Now what's what's interesting about that is I've I've tried to read the Josephus scholarship so I could understand Josephus cuz there's a lot of confusion in the literature about what numbers were his original ones. Mm. Okay. Another kink in the That's another yeah. That this was a months long investigation. This is all part of it, but I'll, I'll try to boil it down to a simple set of propositions. In fact, all the Josephus scholars I've read uh, have said when they analyze his text that he had a Genesis text that was in Hebrew. Okay. He consulted with the Septuagint, we think, but he was working with a Hebrew text. Hmm. And what's remarkable about it is the numbers in his antiquities of the Jews matches the Greek Septuagint. It doesn't hmm. match the Masoretic text. Okay. So... Josephus endorsed and recorded the longer chronology 
which is the Septuagint. That's the longer one. So the, from, the, 100 years added to everybody or most about people. A, about a 1,200 year difference from Adam to Abraham. Okay. If you compare the Hebrew text and, and the and the Greek, we'll just put aside the Submarine Pentateuch for yeah. a moment just to keep it simple. 1,250 years is the difference. That's a huge period of time. Huge change to the text. Yeah. Josephus is recording the numbers from a Hebrew text that is also in the Greek that we have now. So what the evidence is pointing to, in my judgment, is that Josephus had a manuscript of Genesis with the longer chronology in it. He might have gone over to the library at Qumran or something. and Well, uh, at one scholar, a French scholar named Noday. In the library of Qumran, Rick, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know what he knew about Qumran, okay. but he received a gift of books from Titus. He says this in his like the, his biography. Like Titus, the Bible the, dude. Like, uh, no, Titus the uh, emperor. Oh, okay, not the book of the Bible uh, or the general. I forget which one it is. Okay, but this very well may have been scrolls from the temple. Huh. In other words, they may have survived the destruction, the destruction of, of Jerusalem because huh. you would think that the scrolls would be a top priority for the Jews to get that out of the temple before the city was destroyed. Yeah. So now I'm not saying this is slam dunk evidence. It's yeah. an inference, but a couple of Josephus scholars feel that, you know, these, he had to have a biblical text with him and he was writing in Rome. Okay. So this text had to get to Rome hmm. in the context of what's going on here in terms of the destruction of Jerusalem and the aftermath of that destruction. So Josephus is writing in Rome. He's a Jew one of his purposes is to record what happened in the war against the Romans, to give an apologetic for Judaism, to record their history and the antiquities is, is all that from Adam all the way up to the present time to of the, he's alive. And he calls that period the history from Adam to Artaxerxes, which is one of the last Persian kings. Mm -hmm. The revelation of God is a history of 5,000 years. So wow. he 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 calculates an overarching chronology for the biblical era, Adam to essentially Malachi, if okay. you want to say it that way. Not exactly, but you know. Mm -hmm. And he says it's five thousand years. Well, a big portion of that five thousand years is Genesis five and eleven. It's a huge portion of it. Yeah, about sixty percent of that time period, at least. And the only way you can get to five thousand years is the numbers that are recorded. In the Greek. And, and for those of us that have seen, you know, these big wall charts that have the history of the world based on the, you know, the Bible numbers, I've got this one that folds out really big at home and it's like 4004 BC is so. That's the birth of Jesus. That, That's right. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah. you're right. To the birth of Jesus yeah, to from when Adam. Adam is right. 4,000. And so 4,004 BC is, or till zero, right. is when Adam was created. So if he's saying 5,000 years, then that just shows like, he believed in these, the Septuagint numbers that have these extra 100 years that would add another 12, 1300 years to it, depending on, and you know, he has other calculations that you could, you could tweak and fool around with. And there's, you know, but the point of overarching point of that is you have, how I've approached this is first of all, in the research, we have to represent Josephus properly. Okay. Because there's a conflict in the in the in the man in the manuscripts, there's some numbers that are mixed up in Josephus too. Okay, so you have to go through the literature and make sure that okay, is this the original number that Josephus wrote? Okay, okay, so you have to ask that question. But I'm satisfied with the literature I've read and my own analysis of it. It all points to evidence consistent with that longer period of time, which is recorded in the Septuagint. So this is what I call a forensic investigation. Right, it's not just the biblical manuscripts that you study, mm -hmm. which we've talked how they have differences in the numbers, yeah. but witnesses to the manuscripts from mm -hmm. antiquity, mm -hmm. and what do they tell us? What do they? What did they record? And again, I refer to that as a snapshot. Josephus, I don't know, maybe literally sitting at a desk in Rome somewhere, mm -hmm. writing the antiquities of the Jews, and he's saying that Adam is two hundred and thirty years old when Seth is born. Instead of, Instead of 130, which is in the Masoretic text, mm -hmm. right? In our Bibles, yeah. And he's recording, and then he calculates the time period. So you have a cross check. So he not only writes down the numbers for each of the patriarchs, he also gives a calculation mm -hmm. for the epoch from mm -hmm. the flood, from Adam to the flood, 
and from the flood to Abraham. So he does calc- inner biblical calculations. Now, that can get complicated, mm-hmm. but the beauty of it is, again, we have access to someone who's now not only working with the manuscript, but doing calculations in the first century. Mm-hmm. So he's an extraordinarily important witness. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the biblical text. And so that's been part of the research is, mm-hmm. is so that. N- uh, one other thing I'm wondering about is, so, all right, so we have these, these texts, Masoretic text, our modern Bible. We've got the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation from 2000 years ago or so. We've got the Samaritan Pentateuch. They all have numbers. Then you've got these other d- dudes, Eusebius and Jerome and Josephus they're doing their analysis in antiquity of their copies of stuff that's older than we have. Now, is there anything else in the Bible itself as, you know, so it has all these numbers from these chronologies, but is there anything else within the text itself that comments on like these time periods? Like I know I've heard you talk about it before, but you know, when they're talking about, you know, Abraham living a long time, yeah, so I think um like like as the as the text commenting on itself in internally textual criticism, I don't know if that's oh, the right word. Okay. Yes. So so we do not have the biblical author taking these periods like Josephus did and calculating them for us. Yeah. So we don't have Moses saying, and the period of time before the flood was two thousand two hundred and fifty six years. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. Okay. So the audience is getting on to the fact here that I think the Greek preserves the original text mm-hmm. and the Hebrew doesn't. Yeah. So what is, do you have any evidence from inside the text of indicators that might indicate that what I'm saying is accurate? So we'll do yeah. the post-flood period because this is where the, the evidence seems to me to be the most obvious. Okay. So you read your, your English Bible and the ages are, the begetting ages, the ages of the sun that's born are about mm-hmm. 30, 32, 35 in that range, consistently from Shem all the way down to Abraham's father. Okay. Okay. And then in the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, they're all 130, 132, 135. So these are big add, differences. Yeah, added up. And they years. add up. Mm-hmm. Okay. So in the Masoretic text, Shem is still alive when Abraham is alive. Okay. Because you have a shortened, uh, the chronology is crunched. So Shem is Noah's son. Shem is Noah's son. He was son. on the ark. He was on the ark. And, you th- and when I think of you know Abraham, I'm, always th- I'm thinking that's like way later. In my in, mind. In, well, <laughs> intuitively, that's right. Okay. I, I, I think I think there's an intuition that you get about the sense of that. What I tried to do is, I think that's an intuitive argument, so it's like a, a secondary point. Okay. So I tried to find something more concrete, and okay. I agree with your intuitive sense. How could Abraham and Shem be contemporaries? That seems odd. I guess technically it's possible, but it's odd. In the Greek text, Shem's been dead for centuries. When okay. Abraham comes along, okay, the way you calculate it. So, what one of the indicators is from from Abraham's epitaph? It says that he was an old man mm-hmm. and full of years. Mm-hmm. Okay, at one hundred seventy five. But mm-hmm. if there's men like Shem, or Faxad, who's the son of Shem, okay, Eber, Sheila, these are the descendants yeah. after that. Okay, that are living four hundred and up to five hundred years. Mm-hmm. A couple of them, if you calculate it, they're still around when Abraham's alive. Hmm. And they're contemporaries, the other sons and daughters that yeah. are that are in the text. If you, that, if you calculate it in our in our Bible, in the Masoretic text. In the Masoretic text, okay. right. So if you calculate their ages, there's like a whole bunch, if you infer this from from the other sons and daughters, there's a whole bunch of other people that are living. That it could be That are three years. to 400 years old mm-hmm. when Abraham dies at 175. Mm-hmm. Well, it says he's an old man and full of years. So imagine in today's contemporary context, uh, you're 40 years old and you die. Would anybody call you an old man and full of years? Mm -mm. No. You would be called an old man and full of years if you were 80 or perhaps 90 years old because it's compared to a context of people that are around you. Yeah. Okay. So the point is, In the Masoretic text, you have a much shorter chronology. Therefore, you have people that are living for more centuries that are still going to be alive when Abraham dies at 175. Mm -hmm. So I've seen this as an inconsistency in the text. Mm -hmm. When whoever reduced the text 
didn't account for this problem. Hmm. Okay. In the Septuagint, the longer chronology, these folks that live to be three and 400 years old have been dead for several centuries when Abraham dies. Okay. So he's been. It's more consistent. The context is much more consistent with his epitaph. Mm -hmm. So I see this not only as an oddity, but actually an error and proof that the Masoretic text is not the original. Mm -hmm. That the Septuagint chronology, the longer period from from the flood to Abraham, 1100 years, we'll just call it that, uh, is more consistent. Mm -hmm. There's other indicators too. In the Masoretic text, The flood has only happened a hundred and some years before Abraham comes along. And all of a sudden, Abraham is confronted with kingdoms around him, like the the Genesis 14 king king coalition, uh, or Genesis 13, excuse me, the coalition of kings that he fights against, and Mm. um, Melchizedek at, at Salem, the king of Salem. You already have these established political identities with kings and populations and that kind of thing. In the Masoretic text, there's just simply not enough time for the redevelopment of these civilizations in the post-flood period. Do you know offhand when Abraham is born or when he's living his life, how many centuries is that supposedly after the flood happens? Is it 300, 400? Like yeah, what? it's, it's um, I, I said uh, 100 and some years. There I was referring to the Babel incident, which oh, but, is okay, another sorry. problem. Okay, Babel. But okay, yes, yeah, yeah. Abraham in the Masoretic text was born about 350 years after the flood. Oh, okay. In the Greek text, it's about 1,100 years. So, oh, okay. So we're talking about 700, 650, 700 year difference. Yeah. Okay. So it's hard to see how these civilizations could have developed enough populations to have these kings mm-hmm. in these areas, especially the coalition in Genesis just a few 14. Hundred years. Just 300 years after the flood, how the population could have grown to that size for all that to happen. Plus, you have to have the Babel incident occur. Yeah, and it's almost like a restarting of people groups. It's just too, in my view, it's too short of a time period for the coherence of the Abrahamic narratives to make sense. And his epitaph, to me, compared to the Masoretic chronology, is actually an internal mistake. It's it's an error. It can't work. Mm -hmm. So it points to a longer period of time between the flood and and Abraham. Mm -hmm. So I hope that made sense. No, well, it makes sense to me. Hopefully people are following. I I think the people who haven't stopped listening are the people who are interested. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we we went into the weeds a little bit. Yeah, but this really leads to, like, if people are probably asking this in their minds, like, all right, so Septuagint, they added 100 years to all these guys or took away, you know, vice versa. Why would they do that? Yeah. That's that's the question. Yeah, it, re- it really is. It's, and it's the question, let's say you're listening or you know somebody, you're interested, and you're saying, no, no, I'm going to follow the Hebrew. Yeah. I want to I follow the Hebrew text. I, I can't buy what you're selling. Mm-hmm. You have to answer the question, okay, then why did the Septuagint translators inflate? Yeah, why did they make it longer? Why did they make it longer? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the arguments has been, well, they were in Egypt, and they were influenced by Egyptian culture, and they knew about Egyptian chronology. Okay. And they had pressure on them to sort of conform to the cultural norms of the day. And and the Septuagint was, at least the beginning part of it, was translated in Egypt, right? The first five books. So, during the Greek period... Right. Egypt was a superpower. They want, and they were living there at the time. Right. So, and, and they're immersed in they're immersed in Greece, Greek Hellenistic culture. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the argument goes like this. So let's reverse back. Okay. A person listening believes no, the, the Hebrew text is the original numbers. Mm-hmm. So that means the Septuagint was inflated. Yeah, they changed it. Okay, they changed it. They increased it. Why did they increase it? That was the question you asked. Yeah. It's a great question. One of the theories has been, well, you know, they were in Egypt when they translated it, and they knew that Egyptian chronology was longer than what the Hebrew chronology was. And so they changed it to conform with Egyptian chronology. They can go look at the hieroglyphics on the temple down the street and see the all the names of the kings and add it up. And they had a, they had a published chronology in the Alexandria Library oh, okay. of the history yeah. of Egypt, right? So they had access to all that, right? Mm-hmm. So there was a standard chronology at that time. But when I started investigating this claim, and this claim is all over the literature. It's okay. all over the literature. It's inferred or directly stated. So I, I asked a question. I said, okay, let's examine this claim. Let's look at Egyptian chronologies from antiquity. And what I quickly discovered was Egyptian chronologies were much longer mm. than what the Septuagint would give you. 
Hmm. So the so-called apologetic motive to change the text- To line up with Egypt. To line up with Egypt doesn't work because the chronologies in Egypt were longer than even what we get from the Septuagint text of Genesis 5 and 11. Hmm. So the whole apologetic, in other words, if that's what they were doing, they did a lousy job and they didn't get it done. They needed to expand the chronology by a couple thousand more years. They needed to expand it even further than what the Septuagint is. Okay. So, and I go So into, why wouldn't they just add, yeah, 200 years instead of 100 right. years? Well, in, in the flood period, you could- Get you away know, with no, it. No, no. It was over 500 years old when he had his first three, when he had his three sons. Yeah. So you could stretch Adam to 500, Enosh to 500. You could you could make that chronology five, 6,000, 7,000 years. It'd be plausible. And stretch it if that's what your motivation was. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work. So in my, in my research and several of my arguments, I lay out all the evidence as to why that theory doesn't work. The point of that we'll really- links, We'll put links. Anyone who wants to read all of your extensive, which is interesting. I, I, it, it's good reading material if you want to fall asleep. Not just- <laughs> <laughs> We also have videos. Yeah, it, but yes. it, it's, it's extremely detailed and it's really interesting stuff. And so, sorry, just, I wasn't trying to make fun of you too much, no, but it, right. it's really, it's really- it, I'm easy to make fun of. But th there's just, there's a lot of data. Yeah, there is. That, that's been part of the project too, is I found a lot of sloppiness in Christian attempts to resolve these issues. I didn't like, again, I'm not trying to slander my brethren, but the Christian literature has been rather poor mm. in terms of getting serious about really examining all the data. Mm -hmm. Like not critically looking enough at something like Josephus. Mm -hmm. You know, that took me months, hmm. months just to work on the Josephus aspect, which I was talking about before. This Egyptian chronology thing, I asked a question. All right. First of all, we have no evidence that the Jews in Alexandria were concerned about Egyptian chronology at all because there's no evidence of Egyptian theology in the translation. Okay. So why would you think that they were influenced so much that they would actually violate the sacred text, mm -hmm. which they believed was a sacred text. Mm -hmm. So you think about this, the, whoever changed the numbers in these traditions, they knew they were violating the sacred text. They believed they weren't just like, you know, pagans copying the text. They, they took the text very seriously. So they had to be motivated by something mm -hmm. that they felt was an adequate motivation to actually change God's speech. Yeah. That's a very serious thing. So, so the point of all that is, is just, is, is just simply to say, I always thought of the Apostle Paul, carefully test everything, hold on to the good, right? Mm -hmm. You have to test the claims that are in the literature when you're doing scholarship. When you're a Christian, you have to be very discerning about what, what people argue. And so that's been part of my journey mm -hmm. is discernment. So you know? the Egyptian argument trying to align the Hebrew scripture with this Egyptian written history, that was one argument. You analyzed all that. So if that if the Egypt thing doesn't work out, what could be another explanation for adding a hundred years or yes. taking away? So let's take the we'll go back to the post flood period that we we talked about. So one of the arguments that's in the literature is, okay, so in the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, which we've we've talked about in the mm -hmm. post flood period, you have all these patriarchs living contemporaneously together because it's a shortened chronology. Okay. So Shem is alive when Abraham is alive. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So one of the arguments is is from the person arguing that that's okay, that's original, there's nothing wrong with that. And technically there's nothing wrong with Shem and Abraham mm -hmm. being contemporaries, except the fact that Abraham's epitaph yeah. doesn't work with that. That's yeah. the major issue. But the point is, so what they, what they would argue was, this is strange that all of these patriarchs all are living simultaneously together because the chronology is so short. So someone came along and expanded it to make it more palatable okay. so that they wouldn't be living contemporaneously and that it would look more normal for Shem to live, overlap with his son, but die before his grandson was born. Like we were saying earlier, just if you read it in this way, it does, it, it feels, it, quote, it feels more right to have over time people, their ages get less. There's this yes. gradualness to it. Yes. So some people have viewed the gradualness as evidence of artificiality. Okay. In other words, it's evidence that has been changed. Mm -hmm. To okay. make it feel better. To make it to make it look better, to make it look... Uh, I can't get into the details with that because that's a complicated... There's complexities to the argument that I can't articulate here. Mm -hmm. But you have to... Uh, remember that both the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Greek in the post-flood period 
the, the ages that they had the next son, what we call the beginning age, mm -hmm. they, match. they match. So now you have to come up with a theory to explain how did you inflate the numbers in the Samaritan community, which was a sectarian parochial community that separate was separate. from the Jews. They're not, not next to them. Right. They hated and each Greek other. Text, they? they actually hated each other. Yes, they hated each other, right? We see that in the, in the, in the second century BC where they actually, the Jews destroy the Samaritan temple mm. on Mount Gerizim. I think it's 115 BC or something like that. Oh, yeah. So the, the antipathy between them reached its height mm -hmm. in the, in the century prior to the coming of Jesus, which just sets up that whole context in the, mm -hmm. in the gospels. But now you've got to explain, how, well, why did the, the Samaritans, Samaritans didn't care anything about Egyptian chronology or anything like that? Why, why would they care about that? And then you have to, you have to posit a theory that explains the Samaritans and the Greek both inflated the text. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Mm -hmm. So in my research, I've tried to analyze well, how is that possible? And I, I don't, I don't think it is, but that's another explanation that people have come up with mm -hmm. is to try to, I call it patriarchal overlap. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the term I've come up with Okay, and they're trying to get rid of it. So they added a hundred years to it. Okay. That's the, that's the standard explanation. So mm -hmm. you have to, you have to get inside and critique that stuff and show, okay, does, is that a viable theory? Mm -hmm. Does it work? Does it work based on the evidence? You have to weigh all of it together mm -hmm. and see if, the theory works. That's why the whole thing is a constant series of tests. Yeah. You have to explain the data at every point. And that's the challenge of it. Again, that's what I've been dissatisfied with, with other treatments of it is somebody will come up with a theory to try to explain the data, but only part of the data. And then when you start looking at the other data, it falls apart. It falls apart. And you have to come up with a cohesive theory that can explain all or at least most of the data. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a scientific forensic type of thing yeah so you have the trying to inflate the numbers to fit egypt theory you have oh well they're trying to inflate the post-flood genealogies to fit better to make it look nicer to feel more natural if you will if there's a it's um, odd that the patriarchs are overlapped. We yeah. want to get rid of that oddness, so mm -hmm. we're going to expand the chronology. But it sounds like since you don't like either of those ones or you've investigated and it doesn't seem to line up well, what's your theory of why? All right. My theory is scandalous. It's going to be controversial. Like yes. just even the thought of someone changing the numbers for any reason, let alone, but you have an even more scandalous than trying, <laughs> trying to all match with Egypt's timeline or something. Yeah. So let's set the stage this way. First, no matter what, no matter what position you take, you have to quote unquote accuse other parties of changing the text. Mm -hmm. So if you hold the position that no, the Hebrew is the original, well then you have to you have to accuse the Septuagint the translators for changing it to, or perhaps people who had the Hebrew text before them of changing it. Mm -hmm. Right? That could be they maybe they inherited a text that already had the higher numbers in it. Mm -hmm. But the point is somebody has to be accused of doing it. Yeah. So it's not a matter of ad hominem attack against a person that's trying to figure out well. Who changed it? And what motivation did they have? Yeah, why would they okay. do that? So no matter what, you've got to you've got to come up with an, an explanation. What we see of, in the historical evidence, and I came across this in my early days of studying this, and I resisted it for a year. Now, what, what when you started this, what was your original thought that Septuagint, like that they added, that was your original hypothesis? Uh, well, if I could be if I could be candid about it, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, had been slandered so badly in the conservative evangelical literature that I thought that's not where the solution lies. Mm. But then I started actually looking into it and discovered that really the, the slander or the dismissal of the Septuagint was completely illegitimate. And it was a very serious witness to the ancient text and we needed to take it much more seriously. And then when I discovered that in most of the history of the church, Genesis 5 and 11, people had followed the Septuagint and not the Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, there had to be reasons for that. that. What, what, what were the reasons why historically that was the case? So, so I started reading. So I'll throw it out. I'll throw out what the explanation is first. And I started reading that scholars from before the 19th century, Christian scholars were saying that the Jewish rabbis who were in control of the manuscripts changed the numbers in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. Mm. And if when I first heard this, I thought, no, they didn't do that. There's no way. 
we know about how well they preserve the text through the Masoretic tradition and blah, 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 blah. Is this just, you know, is this anti-Semitism? Is this, what, what is this they stuff They held the on? scripture to such high regard. Right. And there was such this huge practice of maintaining it. Right. It just didn't seem plausible to yeah. me. And so I, res- I resisted it. And I kept trying to find, okay, okay, so if that's not the theory, that just seems too scandalous, uh, too personal, conspiracy theory, you know, that's kind of like was my original thinking about it. But then I kept looking at the evidence and looking at the evidence and looking at the evidence, and I started finding that there was this sort of line of demarcation in the history of the preservation of the numbers. And that line of demarcation was the destruction of the temple. Okay. So what I did was I said, okay. Then I started saying, okay, if this theory. Around destruction of the temple around 70 AD. 70 AD. After Christ. Died. Right. After yeah. Jesus, right, right. The temple's destroyed. Judaism Ju- is at in crisis. In complete crisis. Com- to- total complete crisis. It has to remake itself in the aftermath of that. That and the second revolt in, one, in 130 to 135 and against Rome. There was, a, there was another revolt later, 60 years later. Uh, there, it's in a complete co- crisis. The temple's been destroyed. They're trying to re-figure out their religion. All these people are now going to Jesus too. Like that's, yes. that's we haven't talked about that, but. That's that's exactly right. Okay, so we got to get to the question of, well, why would they yeah, change the text? Yeah. But let, let's give the context is what you're getting at. So we have the destruction of the, Jews, of, of the temple. We have the rabbis, a small circle of them in control of the manuscripts. Nobody else is in control. The only manuscripts we know about from that period are from the, in the Dead Sea and they're, at that point, gone. The people mm-hmm. who had those are killed by the Romans, mm-hmm. and those are buried in caves. So the only Hebrew text that we have is the Masoretic text, okay. controlled by the rabbis. Their religion is under threat, and we have the ascending Jesus movement. So they certainly had the ability to change the text. They were in control of it. They were the authorities. The rabbis became the authority. We see that over the last 2,000 years. The rabbinic tradition, they are the absolute authority in rabbinic Judaism. Mm-hmm. The rabbis are the authority. So why would they change the numbers in Genesis 5 and 11? Why would they reduce the chronology by 1,250 years? Why would they do that? Why would they change the sacred text? What would motivate somebody to do something so blasphemous, so against something so sacred? And people who seem to hold the text in such high regard, at least in terms of copying it. Mm-hmm. So in this period of time, you have a phenomenon that's called messianic chronology. Okay, Predictions writings, calculations based on Daniel 9, based on the chronology of Genesis 5 and 11, based on multiple texts to try to figure out when is the Messiah going to come. Just thinking of it, to compare it, we still do that today. We're trying to figure out when the world's going to end. Yes. How many predictions have there been? Oh, calculated in the same Daniel, all those same places. Exactly. That's exactly right. So now, were, we we have now the benefit of Jesus' teaching yeah. saying, don't do that. Only the Father knows. Yeah. Get to work. And don't do that. Yeah. So uh, I but, would say- But to back any, then they were still trying to, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Actually, it's a good lesson for the church now because there's a lot of people in the church that are trying to do this. Yeah. And I would say, stop doing that. Yeah. That would be my pastoral advice to our brethren listening out there. Don't try to figure out when Jesus is returning. You're not supposed to do that because Jesus tells us you're not. Yeah. Now, back I, then, they wanted to know when the Messiah was going to arrive. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say just, yes. I'm not, not going to do it, but if I was ever to write a book, it's going to be like- the end of the world or when Jesus is coming, 4,000 years of getting it wrong. Like, <laughs> yes, th- they were trying to calculate when the Messiah was coming and missed him. They had all these signs, prophecies, they had them memorized and they missed Jesus coming completely. And then since then, have we ever stopped trying to say, oh, the end of the world is coming like in Christendom now? We say it all the time. Yep. Oh, it's, it's now, it's going to be next week and there's even specific dates. So we've been getting it wrong in all of history, <laughs> but we haven't got it right at all. That's exactly right. We stop. And we should stop. So that's a it's a great point. So back then, they were uh, trying to figure out when the Messiah was when's coming. the Messiah coming. Uh, what, you know, whether it was uh, dealing with um, the trouble with the, the the Greek Empire and the intertestamental period, or the ascending Roman Empire, or eventually Rome. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was part of the crisis. You see that in in Matthew, particularly, like you know this messianic expectation that's there. It's there. It's in the blood of the Jewish people. You know, they're dealing with foreign enemies and, and, uh, you know, a padiddly temple in the intertestamental period and, and, uh, persecution. And so there's this wave of 
apocalyptic literature that's written during this time period. There's messianic chronologies that are developed. He's coming here. No, he's coming here. And a lot of that calculation is based on Genesis 5 and 11 because those numbers take up such a large Mm. period of biblical history. Adam to Abraham is a long period of time. And so this is in intertestamental Judaism, there's different views, there's different arguments. You see it later in the rabbinic literature, the rabbis debating about the timing of when the Messiah is going to come. I document all this in my in my research. But that now comes Jesus. And of course, they reject him, mm-hmm. okay, by and large. The Pharisees certainly do, the scribes, the Sadducees. And out of this out of the fires of the destruction of Jerusalem come the rabbinic teachers with the oral traditions that have been passed down. We read that all through the New Testament and the rejection of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So the Christian argument was in that context, hey, this messianic chronology, Jesus came at the right time. Mm -hmm. Take a look at these texts. Now, I don't think they should have been doing that, but that's what the church was doing. Mm -hmm. They were responding to the rabbinic arguments and the rabbinic argument was your Messiah didn't come at the right time based on our messianic calculations, mm-hmm. based on Genesis 5 and 11, based on other numbers, mm-hmm. calculations that they had come up with. Artificial chronologies, I call them artificial because they were invented by different ideas in the way that they interpreted the text. So the rabbis in that period of time, uh, you see this in Justin Martyr in particular, went around to the diaspora of Judaism, in other words, to their communities to craft apologetic arguments against Jesus. And who was Justin Martyr just for Martyr's me who just, doesn't know? Sure, Justin know the Martyr, name, but. church father, second century AD. Okay. He has a work called A Dialogue with Trypho, who's a Jew and unbelieving. He doesn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And there's all these arguments about why Jesus is the Messiah. No, he's not. Yes, he is. And, he's, and, his, and then in Justin Martyr, you see him saying, look, the rabbis are going all around the Mediterranean world to try to say that this Jesus was a Galilean deceiver. He wasn't raised from the dead. You made this story up. Basically, an apologetic to against, against Jesus, Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. One of the apologetic arguments that comes out of this context is the Messianic chronology. Hmm. Not only do you Christians have it wrong for all these reasons, here's another reason you have it wrong. The messianic chronology that we've developed shows that your Messiah showed up too early. He's a fraud. Mm. Okay. So when you look at the tot and, and in the in the rabbinic literature, you see apologetic against Jesus. I mean, they even say that how blasphemous is this is that he was an agent of Satan, which we see in the gospels, mm. and that he is a false prophet uh, boiling in hell, mm. in excrement. Mm. So this is the kind of hatred that's present there. So there's motivation. So not, when we not, ask the not question, by, not by all Jews, but the rabbis specifically. No, I, I'm talking about the rabbis. So this is not an ethnic thing. This is why I was concerned in the beginning when I was talking about this about mm-hmm. people perceiving this as anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. This is a religious conflict, not an ethnic mm-hmm. one. An organization. Now that unfortunately happened in the history of the church mm-hmm. as it relates to Jews. Hatred towards Jews was totally inappropriate from an ethnic standpoint, that's abhorrent, should have never happened. But we're talking here about not anti-Semitism, but religious conflict. And the church and the rabbis clashed over this issue. Okay, so we've gone through a of kind of a journey here. Mm-hmm. So we're asking the question, what would motivate somebody to change the sacred text deliberately and reduce or inflate the chronology by 1,200 years, 1,250 years? Opposition to Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, in my judgment, rises to the level of adequate motivation. That kind of self-deception, that kind of revilement, and you see that in the, in the literature. You see that in Justin Martyr describing those attitudes with mm-hmm. his dialogue with Trypho, and you see it in the rabbinic literature in the Talmud that that is the groundwork for a motivation that's adequate enough to raise somebody to the level where they could justify changing the text of Scripture. Now, that's a very serious charge, but we actually have historical evidence after, in the aftermath of that, in the intervening centuries, Christian writers 
saying, look, the different reason for these differences is because the rabbis changed the numbers. And mm. the reason they change it is because of this messianic chronology. So th there's specific examples of yeah. Christian fathers saying that? Yep, yep. In fact, let, let's go to a, like a, a hostile witness. He's a good hostile witness. Augustine. So Augustine's fifth century, North Africa. Okay. Augustine is trying to explain the differences in the numbers. He doesn't know what, he doesn't have an adequate explanation. He's trying to figure it out. But he rejects the idea that the rabbis change the numbers. Okay. And he says that this is an argument and an, uh, an argument that the church is making, which I reject. So here, Augustine doesn't believe the argument. I think Augustine's wrong about this. Mm -hmm. But the point is, this was a common uh, understanding and explanation of what had happened to the Masoretic text in Genesis at the 5 time, and 11. At the time because they were Augustine is trying to refute the argument. Okay. So that means there's people in the church making that, argument. that are making that claim. He's trying to fight against He's it. He's trying right? to fight against it. Okay. So Eusebius also believed that the rabbis changed the numbers, but for different reasons. So his motivation had to do with the age of marriage and that kind of thing. I don't think that that motivation is adequate enough to get somebody to change the text. Yeah. But Eusebius believed that the Hebrew text had been reduced. Okay. And he gave his reasons for it. But the fact is that that belief is there early in the history of the church. Mm -hmm. So, okay. That's been a long journey. It sounds like just a personal attack, a conspiracy theory. How, you know, someone, people have accused me of, of saying this is a conspiracy theory, but mm. I, I'm merely saying that you have to have a, some kind of conspiracy to change the text. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to, okay, if you want to hold to the Masoretic being the original, who conspired to change the Greek? Who mm -hmm. did it? Some People had to do it. It couldn't be just some random dude. Yeah. It had to be people in a position of authority who had control over the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. We have Not a copies, small circle small. of power, absolute complete power, complete hatred of Jesus, opposition to the church, destroyed temple, a religion that's going to die, and complete control over the manuscripts. You have the historical conditions that if you were motivated to change the text, it was possible to do so. So that's kind of the thread of the argument that, that I made. And, and many ha have made that argument before me, mm -hmm. but it's been viewed as you know anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And once I got over that obstacle of, no, that's not, that's not what this is about at all. It was a religious conflict. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the now, ethnicity of is, the Jewish people. Is there anything else that within J Judaism or other literature that's not the Bible, other writings that maybe have commentary on chronology, like, I mean, I know of the Book of Jubilees. Was yes. that was that a Jewish written material, or and and what is the Book of Jubilees actually? Yeah, so you have it's called uh, what we call a, a pseudepigraphal literature from the Second Temple period, and so Jubilees was written around 160 BC. Okay, and uh, it purports to be the writing of Moses, which okay. is not. So that's why we call it pseudo li yeah. like lie, pseudo false okay. writing. It's claiming to be written by Moses. It's not. And it's very interested in uh, the seven and 49-year periods of jubilees that we see in the Old Testament. And what they do in the text is they impose it upon the history of the Old Testament text, and then they sort of rewrite the text. So in, in Leviticus, and when, they're Jesus, or when Moses was presenting the law from the Lord, every seven years, there were things that happened. You had yes. to rest and like free the slaves. And every 49 years was like a seven times seven. The Jubilee the ju of Jubilees. The year of Jubilees. And yes. so it's like a big deal. Yes. And so you're saying that the book of Jubilees tries to impose those 49 years as a, like a background and trying to fit things into it. Is that what happened? That's right. It what it does is, is it takes the, the history, and it gives a history from Adam to uh, the entrance of Joshua into Can Canaan. Okay. And it rewrites the whole chronology of the biblical text and it imposes this jubilee structure on it. Okay. Okay. So I use this as evidence of saying, now it's not messianic. They're not trying to calculate the timing of the Messiah, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a recap made artificial chronology. They're changing stuff. They're changing the biblical chronology to fit this preconceived idea. So what, what I'm arguing in, in my overall work is that this work is part of the evidence 
of the willingness to manipulate the chronology of the biblical text for certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what's going on with the book of Jubilees. It's a fascinating book to read. Mm -hmm. And because it goes back before, you know, into 160 BC is when it originated, it has great value to us in terms of understanding the biblical text. But it's part of the matrix of evidence of a intellectual, philosophical, and theological context where people who study the biblical text are actually willing to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. And it records numbers for Genesis 5 and 11. Mm -hmm. It manipulates the the age of Abraham. It manipulates manipulates almost every number Mm -hmm. that we find in our Bibles. Mm -hmm. And so- But it doesn't do it by exactly 100 years, does it? it, Well, yeah. See, in in some cases, some of those numbers, I think- are part of what ends up in the Masoretic text later, and then others are not. Mm. So it's a very it's an interesting conglomeration okay. of different numbers, especially in Genesis eleven. There's numbers that are in Genesis eleven that are not found in any manuscripts. They're mm. just. I think the whole thing is artificial. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Of overall, and you can show that you can you can show that their interest was not the accuracy. They wanted to impose this. They wanted to show that there were fifty jubilees from Adam. To the entrance into the promised land. That's they, what they were that trying was their to goal. do. Okay. They just put this whole grid over top of mm-hmm. scripture. What's the point of that related to our discussion, which has gotten very deep? Mm-hmm. It's a willingness to manipulate the chronology of the biblical text for certain outcomes. Was that present in this period of time in Judaism? And the answer to me is clearly yes. And therefore, if you're in that ideological context, it's setting the stage for what the rabbis do later, mm-hmm. I think is where the, where the, the evidence goes. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. You'll read in the literature, a lot of people will slander the translators in Alexandria, the Greek translators. Oh, they didn't have the kind of reverence for the biblical text that the Jews in Palestine had, and they didn't care as much as the text, and so they did this to the text, and they did that to the text. But actually, when you read the intertestamental literature, you find that it's not quite true exactly. There was a lot of stuff going on with these intertestamental works mm-hmm. that point to something quite different. Mm-hmm. And when we look at the evidence, the translators actually treated the Genesis text very conservatively, which gives us more evidence that they didn't change the numbers. Mm-hmm. They had numbers that are in the Greek text that was in their Hebrew text. Mm-hmm. So, And even just to kind of sort of wrap kind of some larger ideas about it yes let's say even if they the numbers weren't changed and what we have in our our english bibles you know is correct in the grand scheme of things like it doesn't like change anything to like the themes of the bible or right like right or salvation or god's faithfulness or so they lived a little longer or like this and i mean it has it has effects for if you're trying to calculate other things like when was the flood and those kinds yes. of things. But from a theological standpoint, it, it doesn't affect really any of the actual points you should be taking out of the Bible uh, from a, or, you know. Yes, that, that's right. Th- this, this particular investigation does not affect, uh, as far as I can think of it, any kind of, it doesn't have any theological ramifications. So in other words, I date the flood to about 3,300 BC, based on what I've been saying. Mm -hmm. If you take the Hebrew text, it puts it probably about 2,400, 2,500. Okay. That's an eight, 900 year difference. Mm -hmm. Is that of theological significance? Does that affect the gospel per se? Does it affect your walk with Christ? Does it affect anything? Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect any of that. What is important though is is the truth of since God has given the numbers, Mm -hmm. And someone has manipulated them, and God gave them, they're important enough for us to discover which are the right ones. Mm-hmm. So the truth, in its in a broader sense, is at stake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not theologically, but just in terms of what's, what's accurate, what's the truth. Yeah. The bigger implication is the point that you put your finger on is, if you want to develop scientific and archaeological models based on dates— you got to get the date of the flood right. This That becomes the important Because thing. if you go out and say the flood happened based on the Masoretic text and that number's wrong, then your apologetic argument's going to be wrong and that doesn't help the church. Yeah. So that's 
probably the bigger issue is mm-hmm. what kind of apologetics will come out of the wrong numbers. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, the person who doesn't believe in the church who thinks the numbers are artificial or you can't cal- calculate a chronology, well, the numbers don't really matter. It doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. But to me, I've gotten to the place where they actually matter a great deal. So I think that's the best way to answer that. Yeah. It would be more a concern of A, truth, because it's, it's a scandalous thing that people yeah. have done this to the text. We want to, we don't want to, I don't want to accuse people. I mean, the rabbi has been dead for 2,000 years, mm-hmm. whoever did it. They have to deal with God, but we want to know the truth in the present day. And then the apologetic part of it is the important part. Because if we make bad apologetic arguments, it doesn't help the gospel. Mm-hmm. You know you know what I mean? And that's what we want to do. Yeah. So. And when you set off to do this, did your position, well, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but did your position change? Did you think you were going to find one thing, but the evidence led you to somewhere else? And then once you've kind of. I know you're on, it's ongoing research. You're still people, sure. you, you share your arguments and then people are like, well, did you consider this? And then you have to research for another couple months. And then <laughs> but, <laughs> that's happened a few times, by the way, <laughs> but what for, for you, what has the journey been like? And you know, how did, is the outcome what you thought it was going to be? And what's kind of your main takeaway? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. Well, let, let's go back beyond my start of the research and then my interest in this goes back 20 years, but I wasn't, uh, I was interested in it, but I wasn't trained. Okay. So I didn't have any training in Hebrew or Greek or manuscripts or any of that kind of stuff. So I was on a yo-yo. As first, it was it's a chronology, and I'm going to follow the Masoretic text. And I said, no, there's gaps. There's no you can't calculate a chronology. You can push the flood back a few thousand years, and it's okay. Still follow the Masoretic text. No, back to the Masoretic text. It is a chronology. I went. I was on literally up and down on a yo-yo. The one thing I never considered seriously was this, was the Greek text, mm-hmm. because as again I said, all the literature I had read superficially at that point had slandered the Septuagint so bad I just threw it out. Mm-hmm. So the surprise was how reliable the Septuagint is on this issue and in other areas too, but particularly on the numbers and how far back it goes. Mm-hmm the volume of the evidence, how much the church was interested in this subject, believe it or not. You know, most people listening maybe generically going, well, who's interested in this? Well, mm-hmm. you read you read through the literature of the history of the church, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. That was a surprise. And the surprise, the biggest surprise was coming to the conclusion that I thought that the rabbis in control of the text actually changed it. Mm. That surprised me. I had seen that in the literature before and completely rejected it. And then when I got to the point where I realized that that was the only theory that could explain almost all the evidence, just comes, there's some anomalies that I'm still working on, mm-hmm. but that could best explain the evidence as a theory. It was kind of shocking to me. But then when I thought about the theological implications of what man is willing to do to suppress the truth and mm-hmm. get away from the Lordship of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, we see that in millions of ways. So why would we think that even men who are in control of the biblical text would not be willing to do the same thing? They were willing to crucify their Messiah. Mm -hmm. It's not a far cry to say they were also willing to manipulate the text to deny him. Mm -hmm. You, You know what I mean? That was shocking like th- theologically not shocking like that men are capable of such things yeah but shocking that i actually came around to a conclusion that i then knew was going to be scandalous and was going to be difficult to defend like i knew i could defend it from the uh, evidence because i drew that conclusion mm-hmm. but i knew that there were going to be folks that have a high view of the bible like i do that were really going to have a hard time with it and i've had people i had one person write to me and says i i not only don't believe that i refuse to believe that Hmm. you know, somebody who's working on this very issue. So, you know, what do I do with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just keep investigating. Yeah. One one thing you just, I just thought of that you were saying that made me think of it. Maybe another example of the Jews in control of the text. It made me think of the Catholic church in control of the Latin text. Now they weren't necessarily changing the text for whatever, but because they were the keepers of it, it was in a language that the common man couldn't read. You can manipulate interpretation. You can, in, the interpretation, yes. they, they became so powerful over Europe and kings wanted their approval on stuff. And so the Pope and all the cardinals and all that yes. stuff, like they, they were in power because they controlled 
the text. It's it's not exactly the same thing as the rabbis and what you know you're proposing they they did, but just to your point of what man is willing to hold on to, manipulate, control for their yeah. own power or desires, that just seems like basic humanity. Well, yeah, I mean, you look at the history of the 20th century and man is capable of just about anything, right? So, yeah, I think that is actually something I had never thought about before. Yeah, Rome didn't manipulate the manuscripts, but what the people heard about, what was in the manuscripts, yeah. they certainly manipulated towards their own ends, for their own gains, for their own purposes, cut people off from the gospel. That is as scandalous and as wicked as you could think of. And then it wasn't until the Reformation, Martin Luther, and that's why that was such a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's unleashing the the the, the word of God yeah. out for the people yeah. to read. And, you know, going back to the rabbis, the rabbis control the teaching ministry of the, the diaspora. So, you know, there's documents that indicate that in the early days, they went out and they taught the people in the synagogues. Mm -hmm. So they were able to inculcate this new teaching. Because they had authority. They were from Tiberias. They were from Israel. They carried authority with them when they traveled about. So they were able to, this was another way that the Septuagint translators didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Once the Septuagint left Egypt, mm -hmm. nobody had control over it. Mm -hmm. Nobody could convince groups of people to believe it. Mm -hmm. But the rabbis had a, a religious community mechanisms in place mm -hmm. to be able to not only change the text, but then inculcate it to their religious community and for them to receive it. And they wouldn't know. Akin to what the Roman church was doing in Europe in the medieval period, mm -hmm. same thing. They had control over the narrative. And ultimately uh, to, for Romans to, Roman Catholic church to for their, keep their power and make money, indulgences. And we're diving yeah. into a whole other subject, but it- No, no, it, but, but the historical analogy, I had never made that connection before. I might have to add that to my one of my arguments. Yes. Nice. I like it when I can add, say something smart because I'm not. <laughs> um, but- uh, uh, Well, I, I don't think that's the case, but here, here's the last thing I'll share. There's a danger that my theory becomes an idol, mm -hmm. right? So when people challenge it, I get mad. Yeah. That's what people have. You start That's poking, at, poking at people's idols, then they get. So, I've had. I have to be careful that like this doesn't become fused with my identity because mm -hmm. I've spent eight years doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at the same time, I do feel like I'm an expert to some degree. So, if you're going to give me an argument, it's got to be a good one. Yeah, and there's. I don't think there's anything wrong with that no. either. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a. It's a. It's a. It's sort of like both sides of the coin. Yeah. You know, and I, I've told people that. I said, listen, if I had a better, look, give me a better theory that explains the data, I'm all for it. Show me. We always have to be open. Yeah. That was a lot of ground we covered on a subject that maybe not many people are interested in. So if you're still listening, thanks for that. And we're totally not offended if you stopped listening. But we do hope you join us again next time. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.